your story. You will fill your people with fire. You will blind the devil with glory. And the world will see how you shine. You are proven. Oh, your love is moving. I know you will do it. You will make a way. I know, I know, I know what is coming. I know, I know, I know that you reign. You're the light breaking into the dark. Yeah, you're the light breaking right through the Good morning. My name is Rena. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and I'm really glad to see you this morning. We're going to start with a time of worship together, so why don't you stand and join me as you are able. This first song that we're going to do is called Cherry Blossoms, and I've been thinking about uh, what I like about it, what this song says to me, and uh, it speaks to me about um, how sometimes it feels like it's a long winter. Uh, it's very cold. It's very dark. Um, or my joy is lost. My joy is hidden under the snow. But this song reminds me of God's promise to me and to all of us that he's with us in those dark and cold times and that spring is coming. So let's, let's sing together Cherry Blossoms. Well, I feel a warm wind blowing, melting all the sadness off of my soul, and I smell the sweet cherry blossoms pouring all the gladness into my soul in winter. I believe you in springtime, I see you. It's so good to be with you. My hope has come. Lord, you make all things new. Your love is my breakthrough. Now I sing hallelujah. My hope has come. of the shadow and I have been tested like silver and gold Lord your faith has taught me to cherish that this slight affliction
fitting as we think about the hope that we have in Christ uh, to uh, step into having communion together as a church family. We have the opportunity to have that together every Sunday. You'll notice there are two tables here in the front. There's one table in the back to the left of the door. And uh, those tables have the elements on them, signifying Jesus' sacrifice for you and for me on the cross. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks. He gave it to them and he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. And it's through Christ and with Christ and in Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, you are welcome at the Lord's table anytime in the next two songs. He's the 
God of second chance, how good is he? When a sinner's hope is all that I can bring, still he welcomes me. Father.
good to sing of the Lord's goodness. There's a, something that happens sometimes in the room that I notice when we just sing about something that is so deeply, deeply true about who God is. God, I ask that you would meet us in those places uh, where we're grateful and in those places where we're singing of your goodness and it seems like we've not yet seen it. We say that you're good, God. I just speak uh, even a even a new release of God's goodness that uh, any barriers that we've had that have kept us from seeing and accepting what the Lord's doing that that God in his goodness that the, almost like the water would overflow the barrier even now and in places where it seems like there are just things you know outside of us that are holding back God's goodness for us to receive it. Um, speak against those things in Jesus' name. Let them fall down. Let them come down. Yeah, we trust you with these things, Jesus. Yes. 
God, may it be. And it's so good to worship together, friends. Uh, you can be seated for now, and it's time for announcements, and Pete has those for us this morning. I do. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. We are super glad that you are here as well. If you are visiting with us today, we are most especially glad that you came. After the service, Paul's going to be preaching today. He'd love to meet you by the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you for coming. Stop by, say hi, and uh, we're super glad that you are here. We have a purpose as a community. It is to help people love God, love people, and change the world. That's everything that we're about doing as a church. On Sundays, we have an opportunity to give toward that. You can do so using the instructions behind me electronically, or you can just put gifts in the compassion card boxes. I would like to pray into our giving and our purpose at this time. So God, we're just so grateful this week, especially among every week with Thanksgiving. We are so grateful for all that you have given us. We're grateful for Christ, for each other, for the things that have brought us here today, for your presence. And in our gratitude, we want to give back, God. We pray as we offer finances that you would put your hand on them and turn them into people, loving you and loving each other here and outside our walls and around the world. Amen. All right, so this was a pretty big week for River Heights Vineyard. This was the best week of our year. We had our Thanksgiving giveaway on Friday and Saturday. I am super happy to report that we helped 519 families get a box of Thanksgiving dinner or gift cards once we ran out of boxes, as well as tons of clothing and lots of other stuff. It was your generosity that provided $23,000 that made this event happen. And we actually had some left over, which we're going to roll into the Compassion Fund, which is you to help families in need during the Christmas holidays. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you to all of you who were part of making that happen. We have a Thanksgiving evening community service this week on Wednesday, that's November 23rd at 7 o'clock. We're going to be hosting the Willing Churches of Invergrove Heights. You know, there's some churches that won't hang out with anybody, but the Willing Churches of Invergrove Heights who are willing to, like, you know, Love one another in the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to get together here on Wednesday at 7 o'clock till 745. And then we're going to have pie afterwards. It's a pie social. I don't even know what that is. We're going to eat pie. It's going to be good. And so you can bring pie, but I happen to know there's a bunch of pies coming already. And so you can also just come and enjoy getting together with some other folks and meeting a few new faces. That'll be this Wednesday. We have Holy Spirit coming up, Holy Spirit night coming up next week, Friday, December 2nd from 7 to 9. The three things this church is best at are Sunday. Sundays, retreats, and Holy Spirit night. Holy Spirit's a night of extended worship, which I love coming and getting to participate in, and then a shorter message, and then time to pray for one another and hear from God. Then we go out to Applebee's afterwards. It's a great time. Come on the second from seven to nine. Lastly, one of our interns in our pastoral internship and residency cohort has started a parents' night out. Saturday, I know, right? Saturday, December 3rd, from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock. If you have children ages 3 to 12, you want a date night, a shopping night, or a nap. How great is that, parents of young children? All right, you bring your kids, and they're going to take care of them. This is a great event to invite your friends who say they can never get a sitter to come join you or to go home and get a nap at, right? And here's the deal. There's no cost. Donations are welcome. 100% of the donations goes to the Compassion Fund, again, to help people with Christmas and people in need. And so God bless Jasmine, who's putting this thing together. Let's surprise her with way too many kids. All right? That's going to be a good time. All right. There's a flyer in your program. It's got the details to sign up. All right, Middle Church, which is for grades 6 through 8, is going to happen next through those doors and off to the right if you want to head back. And please take a moment, say hi to somebody near you. Paul Mandela is going to come up and deliver the message forthwith.
Mandel, and I've had the honor of being part of the volunteer preaching team here at River Heights Vineyard. And today we close out our series on roots and branches, or if you're from the east like me, it's roots and branches. Um, a message about contemplation and action. As Christians, that is, as followers of Jesus, we are called to follow and act as Jesus the Christ modeled for us. Our model is the one who, knowing from the start what cost he would pay, lived a life committed to service of others. He would do all that his father asked, willingly accepting death on the cross, the most humiliating of all deaths at the time. I don't know about the theology of the idea, but I've always appreciated the preaching I once heard during a special Good Friday service. The most important thing to remember about that Friday some 2,000 years ago was that nothing happened. That is, Jesus was crucified and then he died. The end. And we know he could have come down off that cross and still changed history in a very, very different way. But we started off with a rushed trial, ended that day with Jesus dead in the tomb. Of course, it all started with a quiet birth in a stable, a humble entrance, witnessed only by Mary and Joseph, some shepherds, three wise men, and some animals. In the coming weeks, we will join millions of others who journey through Advent, a time of waiting, meditating, and preparation for the celebration of his birth again to a world starved for good news. It has perhaps been placed in the calendar to occur at the time when colors of fall give way to the stillness and dormancy of winter, nature's time of rest. I pray that each of us strive to use the coming weeks of Advent to rediscover the gifts of contemplation and the practices of mindfulness in preparing for the celebration again of the Christ child. For gardeners like myself and those who feel close to nature, it's a time of resting and renewal the ending of one life cycle, providing rest and refreshment prior to the rebirth to come the following spring. For us here in the North, a time of hunkering down and pause until the warmth of spring welcomes us all back outside. And as you reflect on today's message, I would invite you to create that space in the coming weeks for, of Advent to reflect often on how God might be speaking to you personally. Courtney, two weeks ago, spoke to the pressures of daily hectic life of parents raising young children with all the distractions and the concerns from today's often perplexing and challenging society. She contrasted that with the comfort she finds in God's presence of unconditional love and everlasting presence. She used John chapter 15 with the parable of the vine and the branches, relating it to relating it all to several of her own life challenges. She chose to focus on the roots or contemplation. In her own way, however, she also addressed the branches or the fruit of that action, enhanced through her practice of contemplation. We only need to keep God close, to rest in him, striving always to acknowledge and be thankful for the, his constant presence in our lives, just as we see in John 15. Courtney used two phrases to describe contemplation. One was simply setting aside time to be with God, just to be with God without any other. It all comes down to finding that place or means where I can most easily and constantly see God indwelling with unconditional love. And likewise, if we look at more at John 15, we can see that we can bear much fruit, that is, God's blessings will produce great results through our action. Pete last week spoke to his own life experiences of living in God and God in him, using John chapter 17. The entire chapter is a long prayer of Jesus to God on behalf of all believers. John, in his chapter, told of how Jesus prayed for those who became one with him and who would be left behind, keeping God's word and living in him. He asks his father to protect them while they are in the world. And just as we saw in John 15, resting and living in God is its own reward. Living in God and God living in us. Returning to the image of the vine and the branches, I am reminded of how in my own yard, I constantly and regularly prune both my apple and my cherry trees 
so that they'll produce good fruit each season. And at this point, I just pray that something I say or something that God has put on my heart would, would touch each of you this week as we prepare for Thanksgiving and move into Advent. Reflecting on the parable of the vine and the branches again took me back to the late 70s at Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Georgetown. That is the church where Lisa and I first came together to worship and where she was baptized, confirmed, received her first communion, and was married all in two and a half year time. <laughs> Father Jim English, preaching on the vine and the branches at mass one Sunday, had one of the ushers coming forth carrying a glass filled with grapevine, grape leaves. He explained that early that morning, he had noticed that these leaves had left the vine that grows on the wall of the church, so he put them in a glass and then took them first to the coffee shop and then to the newsstand, and now here they were at mass with us. They had left the vine to see more of the world, but he said that in so doing, they had made a fatal mistake, for there was no going back for them. However, with us, he noted, God is always there, eager to welcome us back, no matter how many times we stray. With all that said, I find it fitting that I have a chance to close out our series on contemplation and action. As my last assignment preaching here at River Heights Vineyard, this church in its various locations over time has been our home, along with St. Thomas Beckett Catholic Church in Egan for these 32 years. Lisa has felt called to be part of the church plant at Refuge, and we will both miss many of the great friendships created here, many of you being here today. I'm grateful also for the opportunity to have been part of the preaching team here for these past few years. As for the newest moves of Vineyard locally, for the past six weeks and probably the next year, Refuge Vineyard will call the Rosemont Middle School home. For now, we meet 5 to 6.30 in the evenings on Sundays, but come December, we are moving to mornings, either 10 or 10.30, I have, don't know yet. But the average has been about 30 people, pretty much by word of mouth, and the public launch isn't scheduled until Palm Sunday. And before I go any further, I want to reiterate what Pete said about the Thanksgiving drive. We were able, this is again, for 32 years, we've been able to do this, and yesterday and, and Friday, we served over 500 families and households with good food packages, gift cards, and much new clothing. The Thanksgiving giveaway, which has been River Heights' sign of witness and fruit ever since they opened back at the Simile High School 32 years ago with the Marsdens leading us. It's one of our trademark signs of blessings to the people around us. Now, as many of you know, back in the 70s, I spent a year and a half as a Benedictine monk at St. Anselm's in New Hampshire, where I had gone to college much like St. John's north of here. The rule of Benedict, written over 1,500 years ago, is used to guide the daily life of the monks, calling them a constant prayer and work, in Latin, ora et labora. From four in the morning to eight at night, members gather in their choir stalls six to eight times a day, be it for chant or sacred readings, silent reflection, or celebrations of the mass and communion. Time is also spent in reflection, Lexio Divina, which is known as meditating on sacred readings, such as scripture or the desert fathers and the desert mothers, <clears throat> excuse me, mystics or saints like Francis and Merton, Romero or Teresa, to name a few. And they spend the balance of their waking time in service to the community or works of ministry, all of which is seen as just one more active form of prayer. Now, as an extroverted A-type person, the work and service part came easily to me, but I'd be the first to admit that the prayer, or that time spent in meditating on the sacred, was far more difficult. That became one of the reasons that eventually, I, that led me to search elsewhere for my, for my faith journey uh, the end, before the end of my novitiate year, having found the answers that I had originally sought on entering the monastery. However, it was during these quiet times of contemplation when I experienced the most memorable of encounters with the real presence of God in my entire life. The closest thing I could compare it to at the time was that of John Denver finding God in the form of George Burns in the 1970s movie, Oh God. It was after Compline, the last service of the night that Friday after Thanksgiving, 1977, 
I'd been dealing with a long case of misdiagnosis for leg cramps and restless leg, and that led to wrong prescriptions for over three months of what turned out to be blood clots. My parents had visited me for Thanksgiving, and after they left, it all hit me really hard. I found myself out in the sanctuary with only the perimeter walkway lights on, and I was praying and talking through desperation when I was suddenly aware of his presence sitting next to me in the pew. To this day, I believe it was Jesus in a very, very real and concrete way, comforting me and telling me that my health problems would soon be re resolved, and they were after I was hospitalized, and that the questions that had led me to the monastery would be answered, and they were too. But he said, not before things got even darker and worse, and they did. That night, I shared the entire thing with my abbot, Joseph, who to this day knows more about me than my dad ever did, as we have kept in touch over these 40 years, even when he became Bishop of Maine. And to this day, that night's experience of God's presence was the deepest experience of contemplation I've ever been blessed with. But for now, I will return to the beginning, not to Jesus' birth, but to his baptism at age 30, at the start of his public ministry. We hear in Mark 1, 19, 9 through 13, as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove and alighting on him. A voice from the heaven said, you are my dearly beloved son and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and the angels took care of him. And Jesus went into the desert to be tested, but also to refresh and renew his spirit, to rest, to be prepared for the work to come over those next three years. We hear of how he was tested by Satan at least three times, and he was there for 40 days. So I'm sure he spent a good amount of time either meditating on the word or praying, quite possibly in deep contemplation. Another quote Courtney used to describe contemplation was, Quoting a Jesuit, Father Walter Burkhart, contemplation is a long, loving look at the real. Hearing that reminded me of some of the darkest time in my life back in 2002. After the plane crash that took the lives of Paul and Sheila Wellstone and another friend, among others, I spent the following year occasionally visiting their gravesite, something I'm not usually doing. I would at times pray at other times petition God or possibly cry out for clarity, hoping for some serious answers. On the first anniversary of their death, I was there, if I remember, having a very hard conversation or maybe argument with God. It was possibly among the deepest of my times of contemplation and one full of questions, many of which had gone unanswered, and it was all too real. The following morning, there I was on the front page of the Star Trib. I remembered a news photographer that previous day asking me if it was okay to take a picture, but never gave it any thought. During that day, I had then several calls from people asking permission to use that picture in their grief counseling work. And on one of the tributes later that day, when introducing myself to Mayor T. Ryback at Minneapolis, who I only met once before at a planning conference, he joked that he, was, that he knew who I was, having been on the front page of his paper that morning. Since that time, a good friend, Father Kevin Anderson, has shared at our men's retreat that often in contemplation or in journaling, our best times of conversation with God can come from times of deep anger or doubt. When our defenses are down, and based on my own experience, as shared in part with you today, I have to agree. I've read that the spirit leads us downward, that we grow more from our losses than from our successes. And we are called to a place of humility, to a position and a posture of service. Father Richard Rohr Franciscan is the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation in New Mexico. He has led the center for 35 years, teaching all to find those contemplative practices that offer whatever it is they seek, be it a path for healing, or respect for others with whom they differ, or pursuit of unity in our world. 
the center seeks to ground compassionate action in contemplative awareness of God's presence. Both Vanessa and Pete yesterday spoke to the blessings we receive if we live and remain in God, which then strengthens us in our struggles and enables us to bear much good fruit, citing John 15 in several places. Roar and the center of contemplation and action and contemplation encourages us to build foundation on firm ground of the spirit rooted in contemplative practice. In so doing, they are, we can avoid those problems that lead to burnout or doubt while improving the blessings that we can then shower on others we might be serving. And Pete yesterday spoke to, again, the very idea in his message for the Thanksgiving folks here to avoiding burnout in pursuit of justice by trusting and remaining in God. Compassionate action is what we are all called to following Jesus' two great commandments of love. The resulting contemplative awareness can serve as the intentional stance or position where we are then fully aware of God in everything. In him, we experience the reality of our oneness with others and with all creation resulting in blessed justice and healing as part of the beloved community. If we agree to be part of the effort to create a more perfect world, contemplation will give our action that loving power needed for the long haul. Some form of contemplative practice is one of the best ways, apart from great love and great suffering, to rewrite people's minds and hearts. It's the only form of prayer that dips into the unconscious and changes people at the deepest levels where all the wounds and anger and recognition lie hidden. Contemplation in its simplest form is prayer, a life stance, a way of living in awareness of the constant presence of God, an indwelling presence, a new way of knowing. Certain actions or positions can help build for us that capacity to be truly aware and awake to God, silent, sitting quietly or walking removing yourself from distractions, including the need to be active or accomplish something, focusing on your breathing and letting go of the need to control, open to compassion toward yourself as well as others. Let go of all preoccupations, including the very need to avoid such thoughts in relaxing, breathing, and listening through whatever emotions might arise. Cling to nothing, reject nothing, resting in the moment, calmly maintaining an attitude that says, here I am, Lord, trusting that God is already present, knocking at the door. One method I personally have found most helpful is taken from Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. And repeating that several times until you reduce it to just be, just be still or even just be, by which time my mind has become reasonably quiet and I'm more prepared to simply be present to the moment and hopefully receptive to hear what God has for me. Rohr, in one of his daily meditations, cited the work of an Episcopal priest, Adam Bucco, who teaches that contemplation is a universal call that prepares us to seek and do justice. Bucco advocates that the path towards contemplative action, that on the path towards contemplative action, one first commits to engaging the world from a place of prayer, not ideology. And that gives you a sense of interconnectedness of all life in God and prevents what some call othering. Commit to doing the work of coming to terms with your own social location and how it relates to systemic wrongs. Remember that talking about justice is not the same as doing justice. Commit to using any power you might have to make, uh, to make the world a better place. And lastly, practice works of mercy, making sure that your hands touch those who suffer. Deepening your connection to God, if in you and around you, don't fear the strong feelings of love, of joy, and even the pain that is present. Sounds like a pretty good understanding of Micah 6, 8, which I'll refer to later. St. Francis believed that the contemplative is moved to be servant to those in need and in solidarity with the oppressed. And then we can pro rejoice profoundly and challenge the principalities and powers that create cultural inequities, 
we, get, we can begin to see that contemplation is the fertile soil out of which the fool of God is begotten. The deeper prayer Francis and others call for includes stillness before and listening to God, communing with the Creator who is always there. The Gospel portrays Jesus as one who prayed deeply, frequently withdrawing to solitude for prayer, such as Moses and Elijah and others in the tradition have done. Another friend of mine, Ellie Rocher, has been on several missions. She has worked in various youth ministries, both here and abroad, and now just published her third, her third book. And she co-wrote 12 Tiny Things. She spoke to those practices we can all easily find room for, no matter how busy we are. In a day-long retreat she gave for my St. Thomas Beckett Leadership Council, she led us through exercises that included pausing and to focus on our breathing, on journaling, on walking outside through the, on, the, on the nature trails surrounding the lake, or to spending time in the sanctuary listening to some reflective music, or maybe just finding a quiet place where we could pray with some simple, simple phrases, all while connecting to and listening for God. Now, Courtney has spoken about that special place for her, Pacham, where she has found rest and refreshment. And I thought of my prayer corner, actually, beside my bedside, where I have placed many objects that are special to me. It's the first thing I often see each morning while getting up, and the last thing I see at night before going to bed. And even if I don't say a prayer, I have hopefully at least paused for just a minute to think of some of those objects, reflecting possibly on my spiritual journey and the challenges, the growth, and the blessings from God. Pete spoke at length about the strength he gets from the practice of Sabbath, that biblical idea of reserving one day each week for rest in honoring God. My friend Ellie, who I just mentioned, would be one who would encourage you regarding Sabbath to start small if necessary and not get too upset with yourself if you can only find a few hours sometime during the week as a healthy start toward the practice. Father James Martin, a Jesuit, has spoken of the journey that helps us to intimacy with Jesus. And he encourages all to strive to find God in all things and to see one's faith journey as an incarnational spirituality. As others have said, we can then acknowledge the nearness of God in our own lives. Shortly before his death in 1968, Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk from Gethsemane Abbey in Kentucky, wrote the following. The contemplative, the contemplative has nothing to tell you except to reassure you and say that if you dare to penetrate your own silence and dare to advance without fear into the solitude of your own heart and risk the sharing of solitude with the lonely other who seeks God through you and with you, then you will truly recover the light and the capacity to understand what is beyond words and beyond explanation because it is too close to be explained. It is the intimate union in the depths of your own heart, of God's spirit, and your own secret inmost self, so that you and he are, in all truth, one spirit. Contemplation makes it possible for us to see the gospel story being reenacted at the very heart of our own discipleship journey, where the story and our own becomes one. It is there that the margins of society can be seen, not just as places of sin and injustice, but of creativity, life, and hope. It is there that we see Christ in the face of the leper, the homeless man, the unwed mother, or the paroled criminal. It is there that the moment of final liberation is unveiled as God becomes all in all. And here at River Heights Vineyard, our purpose is to love God, love people, and change the world. The Thanksgiving giveaway, as well as our weekly loaves and fishes, along with support for Treehouse locally and the World Vision globally, are all great examples of our commitment to our church purpose. As has been said, the practice of contemplation, or if you will, reflecting or meditating on sacred writings is one way available to us all that can prepare us to see and hear God more closely and, in so doing, equip us to then take part in making the world a better place. As an individual, I am personally involved in two key local areas, 
help affordable housing advocacy, and the restoration of Lebanon Hills Regional Park south of here, along with some men's spirituality work. I know many of you here have already found happiness in serving others, all as part of our mutual response to the gospel call. We call from the Old Testament the story of Elijah in Kings. It was not the wind or the earthquake or the fire that the prophet heard God, but in the still, small voice of intimate, personal communion. That is where contemplative prayer takes us, not necessarily in some advanced form of prayer or ritual or song, but in one of the oldest forms of prayer. Contemplative prayer is, in the end, simply that wordless, trusting openness of the self to the divine presence. In that, God becomes more a verb than a, than a mover, more a process than a conclusion, more an experience than a dogma, and more a personal relationship than an idea. God is always bigger than the, than the boxes we build for him, and only when we rest in God and find the safety, the space, and the freedom to be who we are, all we are, more or less than we are. At this point, I'd invite the worship team back up. And those on the prayer team, if you'd come forward, um, we'd invite you each week and today to come forward if you have need or even a, a thanksgiving or just any kind of petition that you want to offer up to God. We have people trained for prayer ministry. And this is your time to, to draw closer to God with your needs, um, sur surrendering your control, your power, and your worries, and just letting go. And I pray at this point that the Spirit come to each of us this week as we prepare to reflect on all our blessings as individuals, as a church, as a country, with an attitude of thankfulness as we gather around the table for Thanksgiving. And I pray, too, that as we move into Advent, for all of us to welcome a mindfulness or an awareness of God's presence as we await the Christ birth, his light and his peace. For tips, I'd suggest that you read John 15, at least verses 1 through 8, and John 17, which itself is a one long prayer of Jesus to his Father. For prayer to the Holy, to pray to the Holy Spirit for the blessings of being able to produce much good fruit, and to find that spiritual practice such as contemplation or the Sabbath that works for you. And lastly, to act, to quote Micah 6, 8, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Thank you, Paul. Let's stand together as you're able. This is our opportunity, like Paul said, for us to respond to the Lord. These prayer folks are awesome and trained to pray for you. Here we go. And we're going to sing a song called All My Days. Thank you. So we're going into Thanksgiving. It's also like an opportunity in this song to, to thank God for what God has done. I also want to acknowledge that sometimes we find ourselves in a place where, at least for me, if I'm struggling, it's helpful for me to start with something like, even though I'm struggling in this way, or I'm waiting on this thing, I'll say that to the Lord, I'll say, thank you for these things in my life. I feel like um, it's good and right to acknowledge the things that we're waiting on and struggling with. God wants to know. I think there's a way that we invite God into that and say, even as we say, this is something that I'm struggling with or waiting on. We're not only telling God, we're actually, uh, in our hearts, inviting God in. So whatever place you are in right now, the Lord cares about you and wants to hear what your heart is. So let's respond to the Lord. Do come forward and get some prayer. I want to say thank you for coming with love. And Evelyn, I want to say thank you for giving so much in 
the midst of the day as I walk in the light you will be right by my side through chaos and struggle in joy and delight you abide you strengthen my heart and you silence my fears revealing your grace in the sun I'm tasting your goodness I'm seeing the power of your love sharing is um, there's that line about um, you know God going uh, before us and being behind us and I just felt like the Lord uh, wanted uh, some of us uh, even as Paul is talking about releasing things to the Lord uh, there can be sometimes like an anxiety or a pressure that we take upon ourselves to figure out everything ahead of us and I feel like maybe it's been an oppression maybe in some ways for some of us. And, I've, and, and the sense that I had is the Lord would be inviting you, if that's you, to say, give yourself to me in worship and, um, and ask and trust that I'm ahead of you, like I'm before you. Um, I'm actually at work in your life as you worship. Sometimes the distraction for me is, I'm thinking about things, and it keeps me from worshiping, and I feel like there's uh, something specific, you know, as a, as a worship leader, uh, I don't always share this kind of thing, but there's something that I believe is powerful in saying, God, I'm going to worship you because I believe that you're before me and behind me and that I can trust you right now, that I don't have to be in charge of something that's ahead of me. It's actually an act of... Uh, I think it's an act, a, a powerful act that actually makes a difference. God actually changes things, and as we invite God to say, God, I'm going to like trust you that God can be ahead of us and be working and be doing work as we lay things down. It's not that we don't care anymore. What we're doing is we're saying, I'm giving this to you in worship. Does that make sense? 
Let's think about that as we as we come to the Lord. Again, our Father 
in heaven the light of salvation oh how good is he the breath of almighty before and behind me oh how good is he God, we thank you for your goodness and your presence among us this morning. Thank you for what you're doing in us. And uh, thank you that you, you are before us, that it's not up to us, that you're with us. We're going to continue to spend a little time in worship together. Um, stay in worship if you like. Uh, come forward and get prayer. These folks will pray good things for you and with you. If you need to go, have a wonderful week. God loves you, and I'll see you next Sunday. Our Father in heaven, the light of salvation. Oh, how good is he, the breath of almighty before and behind me.
I do know what happened. Your compassions never fail.